Hey, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology. So can we judge the Pope? This is coming up a lot. I've seen a lot of people judging the Pope, especially for heresy, saying the Pope is a heretic, the Pope is this, the Pope is that. We need to take a step back and ask as Catholics, can we judge the Pope? What is the Catholic position on this? Is there a history to this? Well, in fact, there is. There's a very long history, and I'm not going to be able to give you an exhaustive overview of this question today. I will, however, give you a summary overview that I think will substantially help you get the effect of the question of can we judge the Pope? And before we get started, I want to remind y'all, hit that subscribe button, help me grow this channel. <clears throat> if you appreciate Reason and Theology, you enjoy the content here, and you want to see that content continue to reach more people, I need you to hit that subscribe button. Also, hit the like button while you're at it. Oh, and by the way, thank you so much for this super chat. Uh, just recently found the channel, and I love your work you've done, especially on Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Thank you for helping me and many other Catholics during seasons of Shaken Faith. God bless, nerds. Thank you, and I appreciate the super chat. Oh, and, the, and Pints with Aquinas in the chat. Love you, brother. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate that. Great to see you here. So, yeah, th this, is, um, this is a question that goes back, actually, to the New Testament, um, to the confrontation between St. Peter and St. Paul. So this is actually something that has biblical precedent on whether or not we can judge a pope. Well, the first thing that we need to consider before we dive into canons, ecumenical councils, um, you know, the current code of canon law, um, pre-1917 canon law. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff. Before we dive into the nitty gritty and all that, let's just start with sacred scripture. I mean, that, that's the first place we need to start is the Bible, right? That's the foundation of theology. In fact, if you look at um, guys like Aquinas or any of the church fathers, the first place they went to wasn't canon law, <laughs> uh, wasn't the magisterium, <clears throat> however helpful those things may be, it was Scripture. Scripture is the first place you go to. So what does Scripture say specifically about this question? Now, obviously, the New Testament is not going to talk about the Pope, right? Well, because the papacy is something that comes from St. Peter and what Christ instituted there in Matthew 16. So it's an office that originates there in the New Testament. But while Peter is alive, you have the proto-pope, if you will, the pope of all popes, St. Peter. Um, so you don't necessarily have a successor of St. Peter being addressed just yet in the New Testament, because you have Peter himself. He's still alive. Uh, but then the question is, okay, well, you have somebody like St. Paul, who is an apostle, um, can he judge the Pope? Well, it's not going to say, well, he judged the Pope because, again, Peter is alive. But there is an issue where uh, there's a confrontation between Peter and Paul. And <clears throat> let's take a look at it. I'm going to share it on my screen. And you should be able to see it right about now. There we go. And the title of the section is Paul opposes Peter. And this is Galatians chapter two. <clears throat> but when Cephas, or some pronounce it Cephas, this is uh, Peter's name. So when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Okay, so clearly there is an opposition here. So already at the outset, Obviously, there is a sense in which we can oppose something that a pope does in a qualified sense. But now we need to find out what that sense is. What well, tells us, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with Gentiles. So Peter was eating with Gentiles before these men from James came around. And these men from James were Judaizers. There are individuals who say, look, in order to be a Christian, you have to become a Jew. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law. 
and and all of Galatians is is about saying no. You're putting yourself back on back under bondage. We have already been freed from those ceremonial laws. And so you who are starting out by the Holy Spirit have then returned to the law. You've fallen from grace. You've severed yourself from Christ. That's the next chapter. So he's he's very adamant. No, this is a false gospel. You cannot return to those ceremonial precepts of the law. You're returning to, actually, you're turning away from grace, and you're turning away from the Holy Spirit. You're turning to another gospel. <clears throat> and men from James, not James himself, they didn't represent James himself. James did not hold to the Judea, uh the Judaizer heresy, but men representing James, that is the Jerusalem church. Um, when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Those are the Judaizers. So, you know, when these Judaizers came around, you know, before them, Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles, eating with the Gentiles. Judaizers come around. Oh, no, he's in my, he's gone. He won't sit around with the Gentiles and eat with them. And it continues, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So what is the problem here that um, Paul is opposing with Peter? It's a problem of hypocrisy. Okay, so this isn't a question of false teachings, heresy. No, it's a question of hypocrisy acting contrary to what you believe. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them so that even Barnabas, good old Barnabas, was led astray by their hypocrisy. A good man, a good man who loved Jesus, fell into the hypocrisy. I mean, I that's unfortunate. Uh, we even see that today. Good people falling into heirs. But it continues, but when I saw their conduct, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. So again, the actions were not consistent with the preaching. They, Peter held to the preaching. They held to the preaching, but they weren't living consistent with the preaching. They were acting hypocritically. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the, truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? I mean, masterful point here. Yep. Yep. You're behaving hypocritically and it is wrong. And that is what he confronted him on. Hypocrisy. And that was legitimate. Here is a case, you know, Aquinas looks back on this, and here he says, here is a case where an inferior can rebuke a superior. Here is a case. A re an inferior can rebuke in love a superior. Now, that's a little bit different than, you know, removing someone from office, accusing them of heresy, you know, judging their teachings. It's a little different because this specifically is simply saying your behavior is inconsistent with the very thing you are preaching. So the gospel you preach, Peter, you're being inconsistent with it. So what do we learn from this? We learn from this that a superior can be corrected by an inferior when he is acting hypocritically. What we don't get from this passage is that an inferior can accuse the superior of teaching heresy. That's one thing we don't get. If an inferior can do that, and that's an if, we're going to consider it in a moment, it certainly is not something substantiated from Galatians. Now, what I've been seeing constantly lately is people are saying, well, it's perfectly fine for this bishop to accuse the Pope of preaching heresy or teaching heresy in his magisterium. That's okay because Galatians 2. Excuse me. Galatians 2 is not Paul accusing Peter of preaching heresy. That is not it. Read it again. He is saying that you're being hypocritical with the thing that you preach. 
He accepts what Peter preaches. He's just saying, Peter, you're not living consistent with it. That's a very different thing. Now, I want to go over something that very, very few people um, have addressed. Um, and that's because the vast majority of people don't dive into the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils. Now, this is the Acts of Constantinople, 869 to 870, Constantinople 4, our Constantinople 4. Um, some Eastern Orthodox will go with 879 to 880 as Constantinople 4. This is the Catholic Constantinople 4, 869 to 870. And here's the acts of this council. Why is this important? Well, you had a case where Photius, um, who reconciled himself to the Catholic Church, accepted papal authority. So it, it ended well for Photius. He died in Catholic communion. He is a canonized saint for Eastern Catholics, or at least Byzantine Catholics. Um, he ended well. But, you know, it was, it was it was a rocky ride <laughs> with Photius, right? Okay, so there were some issues with Photius at various points in his life. And a few years prior to this council, just a couple years prior to that, he had the audacity to sit in judgment against the Pope and accuse him of heresy. He did so even synodally, calling a council. In judging him. Now, who is Photius? Photius is the patriarch of Constantinople. You'll remember by this time, Constantinople became like the second in the church. The Bishop of Rome is first, then is Constantinople, then it was Alexandria. Constantinople effectively usurped the position of Alexandria. Alexandria used to be second. Uh, then was Antioch, and then was Jerusalem. Okay, so by this time, Constantinople is incredibly prominent. It's the seat of the Eastern uh, Roman Emperor. And obviously in the West, you no longer have an emperor at this point. So Constantinople was incredibly prominent. Therefore, its bishop or patriarch was prominent. Now, Photius had some issues, uh, some personal you know, problems with the Pope and various things that were taking place. And he decided to sit in judgment against the Pope and condemned him of heresy, uh, specifically on the question of the filioque, among others. And so what happens is a council in Constantinople with papal representatives are present. And they, they, they're assembled. 869, a council was called to address Photius and what he did in sitting in judgment against the Pope. Okay, so this is a patriarch, one of the most important sees, sat in judgment against the Pope, accused him of heresy. So what we're going to learn from this applies to everyone else, applies to every other bishop in the world, applies to every layman. Because if what we're going to learn applies to the second in the church, it applies therefore to everyone below him. And so they assemble. Uh, from 869 to 870, address the question of Photius. The papal claims, papal infallibility and supremacy, are reaffirmed in Constantinople at this council. It is very pro-papacy. It is very Catholic. And all kinds of stuff goes on. But they come to the question of, can the Pope be judged for heresy? We all agree if he's acting hypocritically, somebody can say, hey, that's wrong. Yeah, sure, of course. The question now is, can the Pope be judged by a inferior for heresy? Can you say, you, Mr. Pope, are a heretic? You, what you're preaching is heresy. Well, we certainly know later on in the uh, 1300s, um, whenever you have the case of John the 22nd, who not in his magisterium utters heresy, but outside of his magisterial capacity utters heresy, we certainly know he was rebuked then, and that was legitimate. But again, the question here is, in his magisterium, in what he's actually teaching, in the papal magisterium, can you judge him and say, you're teaching heresy, you're preaching heresy? 
this document, this encyclical, this papal bull is heretical. That's effectively what Photius was doing. Okay, so here they address the question in the Acts. This is session seven of Constantinople four. And I'm going to go through several parts of it, kind of give you the highlights. The third address by the pontiff, which was read out by Deacon Peter. This effrontery is intolerable. Beloved, and I confess the hearing of my heart cannot endure it. Who of you, I pray, ever heard of such a thing or encountered such immense presumption, at least in reading? Although we have read of the Roman pontiff passing judgment on the prelates of all the churches, we have not read of anyone having passed judgment on him. So now think about this. Hold on. 870, okay? 869, 870. We're pretty late in the first millennium here. They've never heard of this before. What in the world is going on, Photius? You're condemning the Pope for heresy? We've never heard of such a thing. Now, this is a little rhetorical because we're going to see some precedent for it, and these men were in fact condemned for doing it. Watch. For even though Honorius was anathematized after his death by the Easterners, it should be known that he had been accused of heresy, which is the only offense where inferiors have the right to resist the initiatives of their superiors or are free to reject their false opinions. And you think, oh, well, there it is. You can sit in the judgment, sit in judgment of the Pope if he teaches heresy. But finish the sentence. Although even in this case, no patriarch or other bishop has the right of passing any judgment on him, Unless the consent of the pontiff of the same first see has authorized it. What is he saying? He's saying, even in the case of Honorius, it wasn't just a bunch of bishops and patriarchs condemning Honorius. No, it was a council of bishops in communion and in conjunction with a sitting pope who judged a predecessor pope who was no longer alive. So a sitting pope can judge either individually or with his brother bishops in a council. He can judge a predecessor. So like Pope Francis could judge, I don't know, Paul VI. I'm not saying he's going to. I'm just saying he could. A sitting pope, someone who is alive, a pope who is alive, can judge a predecessor pope. And what he's saying here is, but you cannot have a case where a bishop or even a council comes together and judges a pope, even a pope who's dead, without the consent of a reigning pope. Why? Because the first see is judged by no one. It continues this section of this session. A proposal of the Council to the Supreme Pontiff, which was read out by Benedict, a uh, notary and archi archivist. Whoever thinks that this insolence is not worthy of utter condemnation has neither read the Gospels nor listened to the Apostle, where in the former the Lord says, No disciple is greater than his master. While in the latter there is, of course, the precept that everything should be done according to the proper order. So how could one say that these insolent men did not place themselves above their teacher when they opened their mouths to vomit forth insults against the apostolic sea, which is the teacher of other seas? I love the way they spoke. Bishops accusing the Pope of preaching heresy, they're vomiting insults. We have bishops today who are accusing the papacy of heresy not not of a private individual no the papacy of heresy the papacy and this encyclical and this teaching he's 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 teaching heresy men of old said this is vomiting forth insults and it's insolence and it would not have been tolerated by our forefathers they say no bishop, no layman, no patriarch can sit in judgment of the Pope. Only a Pope, a sitting Pope, 
can judge a predecessor pope. It continues, how can everything be said to have been done according to the proper order as Paul urges when in a topsy-turvy fashion, the second about the first and each of those inferior about his senior has composed what is abuse rather than a verdict. Moreover, there is a canonical sentence issued by an African council which says, May each one of us acknowledge the order laid down by God, and may those inferior defer to the superior and presume to do nothing without consulting them. It was in accordance with this rule that the Third Holy General Council condemned John of Antioch. As your wisdom has reminded us already, because he dared to pass sentence on the bishop of a higher ranking see, namely Alexandria, zero of Alexandria, and without the consent of the first see, that is Rome. So John of Antioch, the third see at the time, dared to judge the second see, Alexandria, without the consent of the first see, Rome. And he was condemned for that. You, as an inferior, don't get to condemn a higher C without the consent of the highest C. How much more does that apply to your average bishop or your average layman? <clears throat> then the fourth great and ecumenical council so detested such effrontery that it condemned Dioscorus of Alexandria. There's a name for you. Without the possibility of reinstatement. For he had the temerity in contradiction, contravention of the privileges of the first see and of the rule already mentioned, to put himself before his superior, even though he was inferior, and without recognizing the order laid down by God to pass a rash judgment against the bishop of a superior see, namely the great Pope Leo, Bishop of Rome. What's going on here? Dioscorus of Alexandria is the first person in church history to have attempted to judge the Pope of heresy. And he was condemned for this by the Fourth Ecumenical Council, Chalcedon. Because the first see is judged by no one. And Dioscorus rashly presumed to sit in judgment of the Pope, specifically Pope Leo the Great. He was condemned by an ecumenical council for doing this. This is serious stuff. Our forefathers anathematized people for this stuff. And yet I see people flippantly doing this. I see bishops flippantly doing it, accusing the Holy See of teaching heresy. Our forefathers would have anathematized this. They would not have tolerated it. They say you cannot judge the first see. Only a sitting pope can. <clears throat> it continues. So according to this rule and the precedence of the approved, approved fathers, all those who had the rash presumption to open their mouths or stretch out their hand at that infamous, infamous assembly against the dignity of the apostolic see will have no ground for evading the penalty of condign punishment unless they encounter your apostolic moderation as through divine prompting it imitates heavenly clemency. They're, they're saying this is serious stuff. You're going to be judged by God for this. None of the faithful has emitted insults against the preeminence of blessed Peter with impunity, since as the Holy Pope Boniface wrote, quote, whoever emits abuse against it, that's the Holy See, will be unable to dwell in the heavenly kingdom. Did you hear that? This Pope is saying, you sit in judgment against the Pope and his teachings, and you accuse him of heresy. You will go to hell for eternity. That's what the Pope just said. You're not going to heaven. That is a grave sin. He says, for, uh, for he said, I shall give you the keys of heaven, which no one shall enter without the favor of the doorkeeper. If you sit in judgment of Peter's successor, you will not enter into heaven because Peter is the doorkeeper. That's the idea here. And again, no one has ever had the audacity, this is a quote again from the Pope, no one has ever had the audacity to lay hostile hands on the apostolic summit, whose judgment is not open to revision. No one has rebelled against it, save one who was already ready, who was ready to be judged himself. 
They're pretty serious about this. That's just some highlights from this session. Clearly, clearly, our forefathers did not tolerate this stuff. They said, no, you cannot sit in judgment against the Holy See and accuse it of heresy. Whether you're a bishop, whether you're a patriarch, whether you're a layman, doesn't matter what you are, you cannot do that. Let me also read to you a canon that they passed. So this is not just the acts. This is an actual canon that they passed. Canon 21. Furthermore, nobody else should compose or edit writings or tracts against the most holy pope of old Rome. That's the bishop of Rome. On the pretext of making incriminating charges as Photius did. And as Dioscorus did long ago. So they're explicitly saying you do not get to write, publish material, speak against the Pope, accusing him of heresy. You don't get to do that. Only a sitting Pope can do that. You do not get to do that. Patriarch, bishop, priest, deacon, layman, no one gets to do that. Whoever shows such great arrogance... You want to talk about arrogance. You want to talk about pride. It is arrogant to sit in judgment of the Holy See and accuse it of heresy. That is arrogance, according to our fathers, according to the canons. Whoever shows such great arrogance and audacity after the manner of Photius and Dioscorus and makes false accusations in writing or speech against the See of Peter, the chief of the apostles, let them receive a punishment equal to theirs. And remind I'll remind you, what was the punishment of Dioscorus? He was anathematized. He was anathematized. So the punishment is anathema. If then any ruler or secular authority tries to expel the aforesaid Pope of the Apostolic See or any other patriarchs, let him be anathema. Furthermore, if a universal synod, that's a council, is held and any question or controversy arises about the Holy Roman Church. So if a council is gathered and there's a controversy about Rome, it should make inquiries with proper reverence and respect about the question raised and should find a profitable solution. It must on no account pronounce sentence, sentence rashly against the supreme pontiffs of old Rome. And some may say, okay, well, I guess it could just sit in judgment of him and just pronounce a sentence non-rashly, right? Without being rash. Nope. Because we just read in the Acts, their meaning here is that you don't get to pronounce judgment on the Pope at all unless you have a Pope judging the predecessor pope so no no council can even come together to sit in judgment against the current pope you can only have a council with the current pope passing judgment on a previous pope why because the head that is the pope is there and the pope is then judging a predecessor no council however uh, can sit in judgment against the pope therefore Definitely no patriarch alone, which is what Photius is being condemned for. Definitely no bishop. No bishop can say, hey, this, this pope is preaching heresy in this, in this encyclical. He's teaching heresy over there. You don't get to do that. That is condemned by our forefathers. Also, in the current code of canon law, the first C is judged by no one. The first C is judged by no one. This has a long-standing history in our Catholic Church. And you can see where it comes from. It's coming from these councils who themselves are getting this principle from numerous saints, popes, and other councils. The first C is judged by no one. And yet we all sit in judgment against the Pope every single day on Twitter or on YouTube or on Facebook. Let me read to you another canon prior to the Code of Canon Law. You had some other canons that were floating around that were regulating the church. This one is from the chapter C. Papa, which 
is Latin for if the Pope. Distinction 40, C. Papa, very, very famous if you've ever studied this question of papal heresy and judging the Pope. Here's what it says. If the Pope fails and neglects fraternal salvation, if he is found useless and remiss in his works, and moreover silent from good which offends him, and nevertheless leads countless people with him as the first slave of hell, with himself to be scourged by many plagues for eternity, no mortal may presume to rebuke the sins of this man because he himself is, is to judge all. Golly, so it's not just judging him for heresy, it's also judging him for neglect. Now, could you privately come to the Pope and say in the exact same way that Peter did to Paul? I'm sorry, Paul did to Peter. Can you privately approach him, address him about hypocrisy? Of course he can. This is talking about a public judgment, a public condemnation against the Pope. So even in negligence, if the Pope is just neglecting his duties, no mortal may presume to rebuke the sins of the Pope because he himself is to judge all. Again, there's a very long standing history here. I also want to mention Canon 1373 from our current code of canon law that is actually a relatively new canon uh, although the concept is not new a person who publicly incites hatred or animosity against the pope or the ordinary that's the bishop because of some act of ecclesiastical office or duty that would include his magisterium or who provokes disobedience against them so you're provoking disobedience is to be punished by interdict or other just penalties. So this is a canonical offense in our tradition right now. Again, based on a very long-standing tradition. So in summary, though there's a lot of turns and twists and all kinds of stuff that we could talk about on this question, believe me, I've found it fascinating. I love studying church history and the uh, councils and canons on this question and the doctors of the church and church fathers and theologians and so on though there's a lot more that could be said one thing is certainly established what we cannot do is accuse the pope of teaching heresy in his magisterium that is judging the first see and we do not get to do that no patriarch no bishop, no layman, no council can sit in judgment against the Pope unless it's with conjunction and in conjunction with a sitting Pope. So if you have the Pope on your side and the Pope is there allowing you to judge a previous Pope, yeah, sure, go for it. But unless you have the Pope on your side, you don't get to sit in judgment against the papacy. Our forefathers would not have tolerated this they clearly not only impose canonical penalties on it, but more importantly, they mention the eternal penalties, and that is eternal damnation. This is serious stuff. For a bishop to come out and say, the Pope is teaching heresy in Desiderio Desideravi, this is according to our forefathers' arrogance. It's a grave sin. It is wrong. And there are many people out there saying, I'm going to follow that bishop. Yes, the Pope is a heretic. This is how we had the Protestant Reformation. You remember this C. Papa canon that I just read to you? Pull it back up on my screen. You remember this one that I just showed you? If the Pope fails and neglects fraternal salvation, if he's found useless, no mortal may presume, presume to rebuke him. You know who hated that canon? Martin Luther. In fact, it actually even talks about that here. Martin Luther strongly criticized the claims of papal primacy with the decretum. One of Luther's chief concerns surrounded Distinction 40, see Papa. That very canon Martin Luther hated. You know why? Because he stood condemned because that canon condemned what Luther was doing. And yet I'm seeing people all over the place today, bishops, priests, and laymen saying, I am going to condemn the Pope of preaching heresy, of teaching heresy. I'm going to side with this bishop who accuses him. You know what? You're repeating the same error of Martin Luther. 
instead of going with the virtue of our forefathers who said you don't get to presume to rebuke and condemn the first C, even if you're the patriarch of Constantinople, which I'm pretty sure none of us are, unless Bartholomew is watching right now. <laughs> and even he cannot condemn the first C. Even he will stand condemned if he does. And in fact, I have seen him do so. Anyways, I hope this has been helpful and helps put things into better perspective and helps hopefully moderate some of our comments about the Pope in the future. Let's take this to heart. Let's seriously consider this. Let's realize there's some serious eternal consequences for the kind of stuff that we're doing today. And for those who want to follow a bishop in the schism or want to side with this bishop over the bishop of Rome, you're doing just that. You're entering into schism and you're standing condemned according to our forefathers. Turn away from that. That's the path to perdition. Turn away from that. That's the path to schism and turn back to the Catholic faith. That is my advice and my prayer for you. Anyways, if y'all have enjoyed this content, you want to see more people uh, reached with this message, hit the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment. Also, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support what I'm doing so I can continue to provide this content. Also, I have a link to a GoFundMe and a PayPal there in the show notes if you would want to support me that way directly. So certainly check that out if you're inclined. And definitely, as always, pray for me and for what we're doing here with reason and theology. Okay, y'all. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. ReasonInTheology.com. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course, Understanding the Magisterium, for more information. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.